Lisa Mills of Montana knew instantly when she received a call from the sheriff's department on a dark November evening that her daughter was dead. She said that the sheriff called us but didn't tell us what was wrong and said that they had to come to our house. Finally saying, they don't come to your house unless someone has died. So I told my husband that Lene had died and we need to prepare ourselves. Arriving just after midnight, the sheriffs told them that their daughter, Lene Mills, had drowned earlier that day in Lake McDonald at Glacier Park. Attending an open water scuba training class, Lene had left early in the day to go to the class taught by a shop called Gold Dive of Mozilla, Montana. The police said that they were investigating the incident as they believe Gold Dive didn't have a commercial use authorization to operate in the park. While the investigation brought no charges or penalties to the dive operators, a lawsuit by the Mill family and one other diver was filed against Gold Dive and the liable parties attached. The details that follow are pulled from the 112-page lawsuit that was filed in 2021 in the Missoula County District Court. Lene Mills was an 18-year-old girl who discovered the wonders of scuba diving in 2017 while helping with marine biology projects with the University of North Carolina. Attaining her PADI open water certification after four dives, she later went on to dive at the Great Barrier Reef in 2018. Being the very first certification level scuba divers can get, Lene was far from expert or even experienced. Before this incident, all of Lene's dives had been in warm and relatively shallow dive sites. But to get her advanced open water certification, Lene went on to enroll in the October 2020 class with Gold Dive. This specific class was to help prepare and to teach divers to be in cold waters, which is exactly what the lakes in Montana offer. While on the first day of the course there was many red flags, Lene was excited to return for the second and final day of the course. The instructors for day two were Seth Liston and Debbie Snow, who were both novice divers themselves. Seth having just more experience than Lene herself, and Debbie, who was a newly certified instructor, wasn't even certified to teach diving at altitude or to teach diving with a dry suit on, which both pose their own unique dangers. Being at a higher elevation, divers have to use more air in order to remain buoyant. If they're used to diving at sea level, they'll sink more at these higher elevated lakes. Since the dive at Lake McDonald was scheduled for late October, which is a colder period up in Montana, the instructors told Lene and another student, Nathan Dudden, that they should wear dry suits for the second day of the dive, and suggested that they buy the suits from a local shop the day before the dive. Dry suits keep divers warm by maintaining an envelope of air around the diver, but in a descent while water pressures are increasing, divers need to add more air into their suit to compensate for the pressure. Divers need to be properly trained on how to do this or the pressure can push in on the diver, changing their buoyancy and squeezing the suit around them, restricting their movements, or even worse. Lene bought a used custom dry suit from the suggested shop, but didn't receive an important special hose and connection needed to inflate the suit. Having never used a dry suit before, Lene wasn't aware that this was missing. On the day of the dive, the instructors at Gold Dive drove Lene and another student up to the lake for the class. The group got to the lake late, at 4 p.m., with light already fading and found that Lake McDonald Lodge had already closed for the season the previous day. There were two other students already waiting, Bob Gentry and a 14-year-old kid named E.G. As the group was gearing up, the instructors then discovered the air tank regulator they rented to Lene couldn't be connected to her dry suit due to the missing hose mentioned earlier. Instead of canceling the dive, the instructors told Lene she could use her inflatable buoyancy control device, or BCD, to keep herself vertically positioned. What they didn't know is that Lene's BCD was set up for use with her wetsuit and not the heavier dry suit she rented, which also complicated things. Furthermore, instead of a quick release belt usually seen on modern divers, the instructors put 44 pounds of lead weights into the pockets of Lene's dry suit and BCD to compensate. The full group of six entered the water at 5 p.m. without receiving any safety briefings or discussing the pertinent details of the dive. Debbie Snow took Lene and EG down to about 15 feet this lasting for about five minutes before E.G. indicated he was cold, fearful, and struggling. Snow seeing this motioned for E.G. to follow her back to the surface. Leaving Lene where she was to wait for her return, the instructor didn't notice that at this point all of the air had been squeezed out of Lene's dry suit. Having dropped off E.G., Snow was joined by the other instructor, Seth Liston, and they returned to Lene and the other students to further explore downward. While we do have eyewitness stories from those who were on the dive, one student did have a GoPro mounted on their chest and recorded the whole ordeal go down. The group moved down to a final depth of 60 feet before they saw Lene struggling. She was standing on an underwater ledge and everyone could tell she was trying her hardest to breathe and to simply move. Being 60 feet below the water meant that the pressure was double that at the surface. Lene's dry suit not being set up properly meant at this depth the suit was highly pressurized and was crushing her. 
She tried to kick to the surface but couldn't overcome the weights in her pockets and the lack of buoyancy that held her down. Swimming nearby, it is seen that Debbie Snow didn't even look at Lene once during this panic. Frantically signaling for help, one of the other students, Bob Gentry, saw this and immediately swam to her aid. Lene, in a frantic signal, was gesturing so hard her movement spun her backwards off the ledge she was standing on, and she rapidly began to sink. Her eyes wide with fear as she reached and reached for Gentry, who finally caught her at a depth of 85 feet, where the pressure is three times that at the surface. Lene struggled even more to breathe as her body was literally being crushed. Gentry worked for over a minute to try to save Lene as they continued to sink, but he couldn't find the lead weights to drop them. Lene went on to lose her air regulator, forcing Gentry to share his emergency one with her. At this high of pressure, with it only rising, he knew that they were both running out of air, and in a last effort, Gentry tried to heave Lene upward, but simply couldn't lift her. He was forced to leave her behind and went for help. Rocketing up from 105 feet in less than a minute, Gentry couldn't locate anyone at the surface. After Snow eventually got to him and heard Gentry's story, she dove back down to look for Lene, but was unable to find her. It took a second dive with Seth Liston before they found Lene 127 feet below and returned her lifeless body to the surface. The coroner was told by Janine Olson, the owner of the dive shop, that Lene was witnessed by a dive buddy to panic and then fall passively to the bottom of the lake after swimming without difficulty at a depth of 40 feet. As a result, the medical examiner didn't note the bruising on Lene's body caused by the dry suit squeeze and other issues caused by the high pressure. Janine also allegedly called Gentry to later say that he was responsible for Lene's death. Lene's family have subsequently became friends with Gentry and invited him to Lene's memorial. Going on to say, we haven't had a chance to thank him publicly. We want to publicly acknowledge what he did. He's quite affected by what happened and he's such a sweet man. One of the mill's attorneys, David Concannon of Sun Valley, Idaho, has worked on many cases related to scuba diving. Concannon said he'd never seen such an egregious case. Going on to say that PADI is named on the lawsuit due to the fact that PADI prides itself on its programs and merchandise, but doesn't hold the members of its retailer and resort association accountable. Instead, the RRA members get incentives to sell more certifications and to employ more instructors, which can lead to some cut corners and chances taken. Going on to show that if a shop breaks the rules, PADI doesn't inform the public that the shop has been expelled from the program or decertified. In Lene's case, the gold diving instructors weren't fully qualified and failed to follow the myriad of safety practices and guidelines touted by PADI. But this wasn't the first time that Gold Dive had broken the rules. In July of 2020, according to records, Ellen Hubble sued Gold Diving in the death of her husband Jesse, who drowned in Canyon Ferry in June of 2019. Jesse, who hadn't scuba dived in more than 25 years, wasn't certified, but Gold Diving still rented him equipment, and it was later found that Hubble's regulator was on backwards. While the Hubble case was still ongoing and hadn't gotten far by the time Lene had interacted with Gold Diving, there was no way for her to know about the Hubble case, as PADI doesn't release this information. The Mills and Gentry are suing Gold Diving of Mozilla, the owners, David and Janine Olson, the instructors, Debbie Snow and Seth Liston, as well as PADI Worldwide, for $12 million. On June 10, 2021, in a sad miscarriage of justice, the U.S. Attorney's Office informed National Park Service Special Agent Curtis Kennedy, who investigated this case, that it would not prosecute dive instructor Deborah Snow or any of the others involved in this tragedy. Questionably saying, it appears Snow was negligent, and perhaps grossly so, in several respects. Specifically, your investigation indicates Snow did not ensure Mills had a functional dry suit with appropriate placed weights, and she failed to continually supervise Mills during the dive. However, Snow's negligence did not rise to the point of being criminal. Snow reported that she had no specific concerns about Mills being able to successfully complete the dive, and Snow did not know what had gone wrong. The medical examiner that conducted Mills' autopsy determined she died of asphyxiation by drowning. The letter continues, The witness statements and video from the incident shed some light on the events of Mills' drowning, but we cannot establish that it was Snow's knowing conduct that caused her death. Accordingly, we are declining to criminally prosecute Deborah Snow. The letter, signed by U.S. Attorney Leif Johnson and Carla Painter. The family in turn responded to the decision by the U.S. Attorney's Office by saying, we have grieved the loss of our daughter since the day she left this earth. Now we grieve the loss of fairness, justice, and competence in our public officials who are charged with keeping us safe. This is not only a loss for Lene and our family, but also for the citizens of the state of Montana. We respectfully ask U.S. Attorney Leif Johnson and his office to take a more careful look at all the evidence with the objective advice and assistance of medical and diving professionals who understand what it means, and to consider bringing charges against any and all culpable parties under any and all applicable criminal statutes. 
As it stands now, Deborah Snow will not be charged with so much as a parking violation for causing the death of our daughter. This is not justice. Bringing absolutely no charges to anyone in this case is truly a travesty and unjust, to say the least. We hope the Mills family and all those affected by Lene's passing are able to know that we stand behind them and feel that the negligence shown by the diving instructors and the gold dive shop certainly deserve charges to be brought to a jury. Lene was a novice diver and trusted people who she thought had her well-being and safety in mind. Little did she know she put her safety in the hands of those who had little more experience than her and were in over their heads. This is a great reminder to never blindly trust those who you know little about. In closing, we want to say, rest in peace to Lene. She left this earth way too young, and from what her journal writings show, she was an excited and intelligent young woman who had a full life to live and many more smiles to give her family. Finally, please tell your loved ones that you love them today, because you never know when it will be the last time you are able to do so. And that is the story of Lene Mills. If you want to hear more scary, fascinating stories, make sure to watch last week's video.